Abraham's Hebron, Then and Now, presented by Jeffrey M. Bradshaw in five parts. Part three, Jacob's Well and the Tombs of Joseph and Rachel. The purpose of this series is to provide a brief introduction to some of the places linked in tradition to the lives of the family of Abraham and Sarah. Many, though not all of the sites we will visit, are in or near the city of Hebron. Although our archaeology cannot directly substantiate the scriptural stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it can tell us something about the geography, settlements, and daily life of their contemporaries. Learning more about these places helps us get a more realistic sense of the setting in which the patriarchs lived. It is hoped that this series of presentations will increase exposure to these sites, so rich in biblical history and tradition. To visit Jacob's well on the tomb of Joseph, we will go northward from Hebron in the West Bank to Nablus, where the ruins of the biblical town of Shechem were found in 1903. Nablus, a corruption of the Roman name of Neapolis, New City, with a population of about 50,000 people, is one of the largest cities in today's Palestine. Circled at right in this aerial photograph of Nablus is the traditional site of Jacob's well. The well is located a short distance from Tel Balata, an archaeological site currently accepted as the ruins of ancient Shechem. Circled at left and a short distance further down the same highway is the traditional tomb site of the tomb of Joseph. Genesis 33, 18 through 20 records that when Jacob returned from Padam Aram, he pitched his tent before the city of Shechem, and he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for an hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Nothing about a well is mentioned explicitly in the Old Testament, though it would not be unreasonable to presume that there was a good water source in the parcel of a field that Jacob purchased. After Jacob's son stirred up trouble with the Canaanites there, the family was directed to relocate to Bethel. After the conquest of the Assyrians, exiled peoples from other nations in the northern kingdom of Israel were settled. We read in 2 Kings that they were taught the ways of the Lord. However, the Samaritans developed some independent religious traditions and practices that were not looked upon favorably by the Jews. During the rebuilding of the second temple in Jerusalem, the Samaritans offered their help, but were rebuffed. A hostility developed between the Jews and the Samaritans. This is the background of the well-known conversation between Jesus and the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well. The setting of the well in a partially enclosed stone structure by the artist Jean-Jacques Tissot is more faithful to what might have existed anciently than what we see in some other artistic depictions. This stereoscopic photo shows a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, Bir Yakub, in the year 1900. This is the modern St. Fotini Church that has stood over the site of Jacob's Well since 2007. In Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Catholic traditions, St. Fotini, or Svetlana in Russian, her name means the luminous one from Fos, light, is venerated as a saint, being identified as the Samaritan woman who conversed with Christ at the well, and who later became a martyr during the time of the Roman Emperor Nero's Christian persecutions. Born in Cyprus in 1913, Father Philomenus served as the abbot of the monastery and custodian of the well until 1979. In November of that year, at a time of increased tensions on the West Bank, he was found hatcheted to death inside the crypt housing the well. The assailant, a mentally ill resident of Tel Aviv, was apprehended three years later and confessed to that slaying and others, including an assault on a nun at the monastery and the axe murder of a Jewish psychiatrist in Tel Aviv. This controversial icon which hangs in the church is a memorial to his death. The current Archimandrite is Brother Justinus, here shown in a photo from the mid-1970s. His diligent and persistent efforts and advocacy led to the reconstruction of the current church in 2007. More than 40 years later, Father Justinus still quietly tends the church and its guests, surrounded by the rich traditions and symbolism of its setting. 
Visitors to the church should pause to enjoy the rich feast of symbols that populate this place of worship and meditation. The feast of symbols begins even outside the church with the intertwined Greek letters Tau and Phi that stand for the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem. The intertwined letters in this ancient symbol represent the word Tafos, tomb or sepulcher, referring to the tomb of Christ as a focus of sacred veneration in the Holy Land. The symbol of a rooster crowing, of course, brings to the mind image, the image of Peter, the chief apostle after the death of Christ. Prior to the Greek and Roman division of the night into four watches, the Jews divided their nights into a first and second crowing, the first soon after midnight and the second at the dawn of day. The rooster is a symbol among some Christians of the need for continual watchfulness and vigilance. Also, if two roosters are put together, they always fight. Two roosters also symbolize the Christian who is called to fight the good fight of faith. This mosaic payment just out, pavement outside, just outside the door of the church is a composite three-part image of the way that leads to eternal life. In the foreground are deer. The middle section depicts Jacob's well. And in the background, at the far end, are two peacocks on either side drinking water from a vessel. The deer are a symbol of the soul thirsting for God. Similar motifs are found in ancient Christian churches, such as the one at Lower Right from Ravenna, Italy, of a weary deer laboring its way through a forest of entangled vines. The scriptural reference for this symbol is Psalm 42.1, which reads, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. The second symbol, Jacob's Well, obviously provides relief to souls who are panting for God as one pants for water in the desert. The imagery recalls the promise of Jesus to the thirsty Samaritan woman, quote, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The peacock at the furthest point in the mosaic pavement represents the Christian aspiration for eternal life. The peacocks drink of the waters of life freely, recalling the promise of the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, of Alma 5 and 42, and of Nephi's vision of the tree of life. Both the catacombs Priscilla and Sebastian from the 3rd century AD contain prominent depictions of peacocks as a symbol of re res resurrection. Ancient legends said that the flesh of the peacock did not get decay. The idea of growing from corruption to incorruption goes along with the observation that the peacock sheds its old feathers every year and grows newer, brighter ones. To ancient people, the eyes and the feathers on its tail also suggested the all-seeing eye of God. The anchor was an early Christian symbol commonly found in Roman catacombs as a symbol of the hope we have in Christ beyond this life and, like the symbol of the peacock, is a fitting symbol for a Christian tomb. This symbol doubtless comes from Hebrews 6, 19, and 20, which compares the two safe and sure points of the anchor to the safe promise of God's priesthood covenant and the oath of the Father that makes that promise sure. Quoting from the NEB translation of Hebrews, we read, quote, Here, then, are two irre irrevocable acts to give powerful encouragement to us who have claimed his protection by grasping the hope set before us. That hope we hold, it is like an anchor for our lives, an anchor safe and sure. It enters in through the veil, where Jesus has entered on our behalf as a forerunner, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By the scripture, we are meant to understand that so long as we hold fast to the Redeemer, who has entered through the veil on our behalf as a forerunner, we will remain firmly anchored to our heavenly home and the eventual realization of the promise that where I am, there ye may be also. Undoubtedly, there is also the sense, writes Bible scholar Margaret Barker, that, quote, Jesus the high priest stands behind the veil in the Holy of Holies to assist those who pass through, end of quote. The imagery of passing through the veil to enter the presence of God, described in Hebrews, of course, comes from Israelite temples, and is carried over in the iconostasis 
and curtain over the royal doors in the Orthodox churches, such as this one shown here in St. Fultina's Church. According to Brother John A. Peck, a priest in the Orthodox Church of America, the altar within these sacred doors corresponds to the Holy of Holies in Israelite temples. Just as interesting is the circular lamp in front of the iconostasis, corresponding to the incense altar where prayers were offered in front of the temple veil. According to a scholar, Nicoletta Isar, the participants in prayer circles at such locations on earth were spiritually joined to the circle of, agents in heaven above, of angels in heavens above, represented by the circular lamp. The participants on earth expressed their own oneness, quote, in the gesture of solidarity by holding hands, end of quote. Even without drinking from Jacob's well, visitors leave less thirsty than when they came. We now move a few hundred meters up the road to the traditional site of Joseph's tomb. Though the physical site is much less well attested than, for example, Jacob's well or the tomb of the patriarchs, it is a symbol of great spiritual significance to people of different faiths. According to the Bible, Joseph gave specific instructions that his bones were not to be interred in Egypt, but rather in Israel. Accordingly, we are told that Joseph's bones were removed from Egypt during the Exodus and buried in the tract of land that Jacob had bought in Shechem. According to some traditions, his sons Ephraim and Manasseh are buried with him as well. In the days of the judges and early kings, Shechem was an important religious and political center. After the death of Solomon, the ten northern tribes declared their independence from the central government in Jerusalem, and the coronation of Jeroboam took place here. It retained its importance to the northern kingdom until its conquest by Assyria. Though the exact site of Joseph's tomb was lost to memory, historians and pilgrims over the centuries remembered its general location between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, the holy mountain of the Samaritans. At the time this photo was taken, the tomb of, the tomb of Joseph was in ruins. But by 1894, it had been restored to a shape that resembles more or less its current form. The current site contains a small complex of buildings, mostly of Muslim origin. Note the tree in the square enclosure in front of the tomb, resembling the tree in front of Adam's grave in the tomb of the patriarchs. During the occupation of the West Bank, the tomb's interior was extensively renovated by the Israeli authorities. However, since that time, the site has been repeatedly vandalized and many artifacts have been removed or destroyed. The Israeli military semi-regularly co coordinates visits to the site for Jewish prayer services. This photo shows a night visit under IDF guard in November 2009, during a period when the dome over the monument had been destroyed. At the time of our most recent visit in 2014, access was still difficult, and up to the last minute we were not sure whether our visit would be permitted by the authorities. We were grateful to see that the shattered dome had been repaired, but some things, like the tree in front of the entrance, had not been replaced. Within the tomb, the cenotaph of Joseph remained undisturbed. In 2015, a little more than a year after the previous photos were taken, a group of Palestinians set fire to the compound, sparking condemnations from Palestinian and Israeli authorities. The tomb itself appeared to be unharmed, but the fire marked another downturn in Israeli-Palestinian conflict after weeks of renewed violence. On the road that joins Bethlehem and Jerusalem is Rachel's tomb. Chapter 35 of Genesis records that after Rachel travailed and had hard labor, her midwife sympathetically said to her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. As her soul was in departing, for she died, she called his name Ben-Oni, son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, son at the right hand. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. For hundreds of years, this spot sacred to the memory of Rachel was marked by a cenotaph, sheltered by a small cupola. By the 19th century, a small building had been constructed. This is how Rachel's tomb appeared in about 1977. 
At the end of 2000, when the Second Intifada, Intifada broke out, the tomb came under attack for 41 days. In May 2001, 50 Jews found themselves trapped inside by a firefight between the IDF and the Palestinian Authority gunmen. In March 2002, the IDF returned to Bethlehem. In September 2002, the tomb was incorporated on the Israeli side of the West Bank barrier and surrounded by a concrete wall and watchtowers. In February 2005, the Israeli Supreme Court rejected a Palestinian appeal to change the route of the security fence in the region of the tomb. Israeli construction destroyed the Palestinian neighborhood of Kubat Rahil. Israel also declared the area to be part of Jerusalem, removing it from the former jurisdiction of the Palestinians. The same pillars and the rest of the building that were shown in the outdoor photo from the 1970s is now fully enclosed. This sign reads, Tomb of Rachel. Here a Jewish man studies in front of a cenotaph for Rachel, decorated with an image of the former tomb. Women worship in a separate area. The space is small and crowded. In mystical strands of Judaism, the symbolism of the Tree of Life takes center stage in study and contemplation. In the next video, we turn our backs on the road to Jerusalem and return to explore ancient Hebron.